Good morning, Saints. We're going to talk about a topic that I've hit on a couple of times, but sort of in passing to a different point. And I was at the coffee shop this morning just reading through uh, the last part of the book of Acts, and and uh, this whole concept just came flooding back, and I'm assuming that was spirit prompted. So I'm going to go ahead and do a a video on this teaching again and it's about uh, John the Baptist gospel of the kingdom and I just want to make sure that you know at least in my teaching <clears throat> we we draw a distinction um, between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel that the Apostle Paul was given to preach which was for the church age because I think it's really easy when we say gospel, 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 just to get confused. Now that the entire body of scripture is the good news, the redemption of humanity, right? But the the specific gospel given by John the Baptist and, and actually by Jesus when he walked the earth here is different than the gospel that was given for the church. And, we're going to do a little bit of that comparison and shows how it plays show how it plays out through the book of Acts a little bit, but then I think it'll help when you go back to Scripture and especially you look at what the message was, you know, prior to Jesus' first coming and what it's going to be again after the church leaves the earth. So that's the point of today's message. And so let's start just what was John the Baptist saying? <laughs> and then what was Jesus saying at his first coming? Let's start at Matthew 3, 1 through 12. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is what he had spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, or yeah. Isaiah saying the voice of the one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord make his path straight so John's message you know the kingdom of heaven is at hand was preparing the way for the king and you know let's get this the and during the church age what is being talked about here is after Jesus' second coming, the setup of the kingdom age, the millennial reign, the fulfillment, the promise to Mary of the Davidic covenant, that it, uh, the descendant of David would always be on the throne, right? It has to be fulfilled, yet the promise has not happened. And so when people think about the broad notion of kingdom from the Bible, yes, God's always been on the throne. But very specifically, when the preaching was going on to the Jewish people, it was in the context of the promises given to the Jewish people, and that is that you know they would live with their Lord, um, that they would be children of God, a holy nation, a set apart nation. You know, go back to the promises, you know, Deuteronomy, and see what was promised to the children of Israel, what was promised at Mount Sinai. Go take a look at that, you know. Um, so here, here's what we got then is, you know, John the Baptist was preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we can just keep reading here. And John came, had his raiment of camel's hair and leather girdle was his loins and meat was locust and wild honey and he went out to Jerusalem and Judea and all the region about the Jordan and they were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins so how do you get into the kingdom confession of sins recognizing that uh, the king is coming right make his path straight that's so that's John's baptism that's what John was doing when he came <clears throat> let's just come down here and see him repeat this. <clears throat> but when many saw the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? 
well, what was he talking about here? He was talking about the judgment that when the king arrives on the throne, he's going to judge, right? We see it in the sheep and goat judgment, Matthew 25. You see it in uh, Ezekiel 20, second half of the chapter, the, the pairing out of the Israelites before they enter the kingdom. Bring forth the fruits, meet for repentance. And think not to say to yourselves, we have Abraham our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid at the root of the trees, therefore every knee which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Indeed, I baptize you with water unto repentance. That was the point of his baptism, is repentance so that they could enter the kingdom. But he that come after me, he is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So there's a distinction of John's baptism, which is repentance. We just read this, and it's entry into the kingdom. Jesus' baptism going forward would be with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, I didn't include the scripture here. But you guys are familiar with your Bible. Later on, as Jesus was preaching, he promised the apostles that um, that stay here in the city, and he would give them the the Holy Ghost. And so, the Jesus giving of the Holy Ghost happened right at his time of his death, right? And that's the Holy Ghost message. Um, the Holy Ghost being received happened really post Jesus' death in terms of the Jews, in terms of the Gentiles during the church age. So there's the fulfillment. So there's a distinction. John's baptism of repentance to enter the kingdom and the promise that after Jesus comes, that's when the Holy Ghost will be given with fire. And we'll, we'll read about that here when we take a look at the gospel that Paul was given okay whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat into the garner and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire and that's at his return right so we've we've got that now the distinction between what those baptisms were let's come down and uh, take a look at Matthew 4 12 Jesus' ministry. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. After leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which was upon the sea coast, the borders of Zebulun and Nep Nephtalim. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, in the land of Zebulun, in the land of Nephtalim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness now saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region saw region of the shadow of death light has sprung up from that time jesus began to preach and say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand the exact same message of john the baptist right jesus and his disciples did not go around town to town saying they're going to hang me on a cross and my death burial and resurrection is going to lead lead you into the everlasting life that wasn't his message. His message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, let's go down here now. Um, just check out verse 23, just a little bit below. And Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Now those were the promises, the Old Testament promises of the coming Messiah. And so he's now fulfilling, as he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he's fulfilling and doing the deeds of the promised Messiah from the Old Testament, right? That's that's what he <laughs> that's what he came. He came to the Jews, not the Gentiles. He came to the Jews as their promised Messiah. And you know, several instances he actually told, you know, the the woman that came to him, um, I forget the Gentile region, she came to him 
uh, inquiring about healing his da her daughter, and he said that he didn't come, you know, for the dogs, that he came for the Jewish people. And she said, well, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. And Jesus said, what faith? And he actually healed her daughter. But, you know, that was on an exception basis. He says clearly he came to the Jewish people. So he was trying to, he was fulfilling the role of the Messiah when he came. And that would have been, you know, this message to get into the kingdom. The kingdom's at hand. They needed baptism for repentance that John introduced that Jesus' disciples followed up with. So let's let's not take it from me. Let's take it from Dr. Toussaint. I've used this video before, but I think it's really good. Um, he was professor for 47 years, um, most of it at Dallas Theological Seminary. Not a lightweight. <laughs> but I think this is important to get this concept, not just from me, but from somebody that, you know, was a Ph.D., a theologian in this area. I'll just show you here you know, Dallas Theological Seminary edu <laughs> Professor Emeritus of Bible Exposition, Adjunct Professor in Bible Exposition. He has his uh, you know, THD and, and all that, pastor, teacher, expository preaching, right? So he's not a lightweight. Let's just take a listen to his description of the kingdom usage in the Bible. Secondly, the kingdom program through the Bible and then defend it because of objections to it, passages that are used against it. So let me start with the definition. I take it that the kingdom of God, well, I should say, first of all, that when you think of the kingdom of God, there are two aspects. Everybody agrees on the first one. No dispute on the first one. The first one is it's, it's God's sovereign rule over the universe. It's just God's kingdom, God's sovereign rule. It's present. It's universal, it's the eternal. Here are a few references very quickly. Psalm 29, verse 10. The Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. That's just God's sovereign reign. Psalm 101, no, excuse me, Psalm 10, verse 16. The Lord is king forever and ever. Psalm 103, verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. You have the same thing in Daniel chapter 4. Remember Nebuchadnezzar uh, was reduced to living like an animal, then, then uh, he was redeemed, he was, he, was, he was restored, I should say. And uh, he said that he, he learns that God sits over the kingdoms of, of the earth, the basest of men, which I better not say anything more about that, but God sits over the kingdoms of the world, the basis of men. And then he goes on to talk about God being sovereign over all. He is his ruler. Everybody agrees on that point. No dispute. The second meaning is the one that's the problem, and that is the, the, the application of the kingdom of God in, in world history. And if you read Elva J. McLean's book on the greatness of the kingdom, an excellent work, by the way, if you read his work, he, um, he points out all the various views of the, of the kingdom that have been existed, like social work, Rauschenbach, it's, it's social work, it's political action, it's all these other things. It's the God's uh, kingdom in your heart, all this sort of thing. Uh, I'm taking it as McLean does. I take McLean's definition, basically, that it's God's theocratic kingdom on planet Earth. Now, when I say theocratic, I'm talking about God reigning through a person or a government, God reigning through a person now, on this Earth. It's God's theocratic kingdom. Now, having said that, let me just quickly give you now what I think is a history of that kingdom. It began, obviously, in, in the Garden of Eden. You know as very well as I do that God gave Adam and Eve the authority to rule the world. So it was God, Adam, and the world. And you have a theocratic kingdom. He was to rule the world, subdue it, and so on. Well, that lasted until Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned so that Adam and Eve were no longer ruling under God. They didn't lose the authority. Don't get that. Don't miss the point. The, the, the humans still had authority over the world. We know that from Psalm 8, 
Because in Psalm 8, David says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you should visit him, though you have set him over the works of your fingers, and so on, that man has that rule. But it's not yet being accomplished. That's what Hebrews 2 is saying. We do not yet see all things under subjection, in subjection to man, but that's going to take place in the future when Jesus reigns on this earth. But it's no longer God's kingdom because it was now Satan and Adam and the world. It's no longer God's kingdom. So God's kingdom uh, it just existed briefly in Genesis 1 to 3. Now after that, there's no kingdom of God on earth. God just sovereignly intervened with the flood. There's no kingdom there. He just judged the world. You have the same thing in Genesis 11 with, uh, with the Tower of Babel. God just sovereignly judges. You don't even have the kingdom when you have the choice of Abraham in Genesis 12. God just sovereignly chose Abraham and gave him a covenant and, and blessings. So that, uh, so that the kingdom is not here, yet God is just sovereignly ruling. The same thing happened when the children of Israel went down to Egypt. There's no kingdom there. They were just God's slaves. I mean, Egypt's slaves in, in Egypt. And, and they finally were redeemed from Egypt um, under the leadership of Moses. And they came to Mount Sinai. And in, Gen in, in Exodus 19, for the first time, you have a reference to God's kingdom. I will make you a kingdom of priests. So that that nation then became God's kingdom on earth. That was formalized in Exodus 24. It's formalized in Exodus 24 when Moses took blood and sprinkled it on the book and on the people. That's when I'd be a back row Baptist. I wouldn't want to be right in front. But he sprinkled the blood on the book and on the people and he entered into covenant. That's when God's kingdom was really established on the earth again. So you have God, Moses, and the people of Israel. You have the kingdom. Well, of course, the next person is Aaron. Then after that, the judges. After the judges, you have the king, Saul, David, Solomon, Rehoboam, and you know the story of the splitting of the, of the kingdom, north and south. The northern kingdom was consistently evil. And God judged it by having them carried away into captivity by the Babylonians in 721 B.C. You all know that. But God's kingdom was still in that south with the Davidic line because God had made a covenant with David that, his, that he would rule forever, etc., that his seed would rule forever. It's interesting. You have this, this promise given to David in 2 Samuel 7, no mention of the kingdom. Excuse me, no mention of a covenant. The covenant is found in Psalm 89. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. What are the mercies of the Lord? God's promises to David. And he goes on to talk about the, the, the covenant that he made with David that's going to be forever. It's Olam. It's forever. But what happened was the kingdom of the south also became degenerate. And God punished them by having them carried to Babylon in a series of deportations between 606 and 586 B.C. <clears throat> That's where you have the glory departing from the temple. Now, I'm not sure exactly when the kingdom stopped. It may be at the deportation of the last king, or it may be at the, uh, at the leaving of the glory from the temple. What a, what a story that is in Ezekiel 10 and 11. The glory was so reluctant to leave. First the threshold, and the gate, mountain, and gone. Did you ever notice, by the way, when the temple is rebuilt and the glory returns immediately, just immediately, because God delights to dwell with people. It's a wonderful thought, wonderful thought. But anyway, I take it that the kingdom stopped. So you have a, a, a time of the kingdom at the very beginning, Genesis 1 to 3, and then you have the kingdom established on earth under Moses in Exodus 19, 24, and then to the end of the southern kingdom, the deportation. No more kingdom. Well, the air became electric 
when John the Baptist stepped on the scene and said, Repent, the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. Now I want you to think about that a bit. What did he mean when he said the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven? What did he mean by that? <clears throat> well, first of all, he said it's near. He doesn't say it's here. I, that, that's a very important distinction. I don't know of one place where Engiken, Engidzo in the perfect tense, I don't know of one place where Engidzen, or Engiken, or Engidzo, where it means is here. It always means it's near. The kingdom of heaven has drawn near. Furthermore, there's no definition of the term kingdom, or kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. No definition. No great honk, stone the crows, and starve the lizards. If, if there was another meaning for, for the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God than what the, the Jews expected, there'd certainly be something said about it by either Jesus, or John the Baptist, or the twelve apostles. And it's so interesting, liberals for years made the kingdom of God social gospel and everything else. And then Weiss and, uh, and Schweitzer stepped on the scene and said, you people are like philosophers who look in a well and see their own faces in the well and then write about their faces and say, that's what, what's there. You're just writing your own viewpoints as to what you think the kingdom is. And he, as liberal as he was, and he was a heretic, as liberal as he was, he realized that what the Jews expected was a literal earthly kingdom. And he said, you've got to put that saying in the context of the historical situation the Jews were expect, expecting the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. There's something else that most people miss. John the Baptist made it clear that with the coming of the kingdom there was a judgment. His axe is already lying at the root of the tree. His winnowing fork is in his hand. There's hell to pay. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why should you repent? Because there's judgment coming. And most people miss the idea that judgment preceded the coming of that kingdom. That's going to become very important in, in just a minute. Besides that, you know that as well as I do, and I don't have to go through these passages, that first of all, John the Baptist preaches this in, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. Christ steps on the scene in chapter 4, verse 17, and says the same thing. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In chapter 10, verse 7, he sends up the 12 with the same message. No explanation, just repent, the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. And then he says, don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Only go to the lost people of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. Why? Because the coming of the kingdom is dependent upon Israel's response. You can have worldwide revival. The kingdom is not going to come until Israel repents. There are a number of passages that say that. Zechariah 12, 10, all pouring them the spirit of supplication and grace, and so on. Matthew 23, 30, 39. Matthew 23, 39. You're not going to see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So there's got to be national repentance on the part of Israel. And that's why he says restricted to Israel. How do you explain it otherwise? If the kingdom is a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of people, why not preach it to everybody? But if it's a literal kingdom for Israel, and the coming of the kingdom depends on Israel, limited to Israel. And that's the point that he's made. Okay, so it took a little bit more there of Dr. Toussaint than uh, what I had on the notes here, but he, you know, he really hammered the point at the end that the kingdom of heaven was a definition that the Jews would understand. It's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. He mentioned Second Samuel that was the promise to King David and he mentioned Matthew 23 that the kingdom doesn't come until there's national repentance for the Jewish people and when does that happen it happens at the end of the tribulation period right Saints so you got a broader context and I was just going to add to it that 
you know, Jesus expands upon what the kingdom is going to be like and how it's going to operate on the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew 4 and right in the middle of the Sermon of the Mount, uh, chapter 6. Here you got the Lord's Prayer. Um, I'll just jump in. Um, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. So there again. He's teaching the Jewish people how to pray, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so this is, you know, what's required. They're praying for the coming of the kingdom. The Jewish people should be praying. I know we adopt that as the church and we pray that, but that was Jesus' prayer, the pattern of prayer, because he was <clears throat> he was being asked by the disciples, how should we pray? And so he's he's telling them how to pray. Don't pray and use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they should be heard for much speaking. Be not like them, for your Father knows what things you have need before you ask them. In this manner, therefore, pray ye. So he was giving them the pattern for prayer. Okay, I hope that's kind of cool for you that you're seeing this message of the kingdom separate and apart from what is given to the church. I just want to point out then, because the book of Acts is one long transition from, you know, the Jewish under the law to the the gospel of grace message that was given to Paul. Matter of fact, the first half, let's say, of the book of Acts was Peter, the you know consummate Jew and apostle disciple of Jesus, learning about this change that that was occurring. You know the the blanket that descended down in his vision with the unclean animals and the Lord telling him to wake up and and eat and he says no Lord I haven't violated you know the dietary law since I was a kid and then what does you know Jesus tell him what does God tell him that what I've determined to be clean don't call it unclean so he's correcting Peter's understanding now how things are going to operate post Jesus death and resurrection. And so he's seeing that this, we call it dispensation, has changed. But it took 20 plus years before Paul's message started to to go out. I mean, they they had the Council of Jerusalem where Paul and Barnabas came back. And the whole debate was whether he had to be converted to Judaism. Gentiles had to be converted to Judaism before they could accept the Lord. And the decision was no, that not even the Jews could keep the law. And so the the whole notion was broken there. But that's 20 years past the resurrection of Christ. And so you have things here like in Acts 8 that I think get misinterpreted. And, And this is Philip preaching in Acts 8. Let's just go into it. 4 through 17, Philip proclaims Christ in Samaria. Therefore, they, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things <clears throat> which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed, and made taken with the palsies, were lame and healed. And there was great joy in the city. But there was a certain man called Simon that before time in the same city used sorcery to bewitch the people of Samaria, giving himself to be some great one, to whom all gave heed from the least to the greatest. This man has great power of God, and to him they had regard because a long time he had bewitched with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized both men and women. So what do you have with Philip? He's still preaching John the Baptist's message. He's still preaching the message that Jesus and the disciples had when he walked the earth. He hadn't yet come to the gospel message, which was eventually given to Paul. Not only that Jesus was the Messiah, but that his death, burial, and resurrection was for the cleansing of of our sin. That's the criteria to receive the Holy Spirit. So here you have Philip who was there on the day. He was one of the the seven, they call them deacons. 
he was there in the nascent church, received the Holy Spirit the day of Pentecost, but his message had not yet changed. And so uh, after he had been preaching this, but when they believed Philip preaching things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, continued with Paul and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So Simon and the others that were baptized in the name of Christ for the kingdom did not manifest signs and miracles. This was still just Philip. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. And when they came down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet it was not fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So there you see the distinction. <clears throat> Philip preaching the kingdom of God does not come with the Holy Spirit. It was only the new gospel message, the death and burial resurrection of Jesus. I like to point this out. <clears throat> Continuing down Acts 8 in the same passage, you have Philip being taken to the Ethiopian eunuch. I'm not going to read all this, but um, I ask you to come back. What happens? Philip gets taken by the Holy Spirit down into the desert, and he's running along the chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch, and the Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah out loud. Well, you can get by the context of what was being read that he was reading Isaiah 53 about the how the Messiah needed to die and was buried <clears throat> and humiliated, right? And then Philip Asson says, well, who is this? That is it the prophet or speaking of himself or another man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture to preach unto him Jesus. Then he was baptized after that, right? This is probably, you know, one of the first <clears throat> full... Uh, church age gospels being delivered but it was almost by accident the Holy Spirit ran Philip down there while, <clears throat> while while the Ethiopian eunuch happened to be reading Isaiah 53 about the death burial and resurrection of the Messiah and then he gets baptized but notice he's not speaking in tongues he's not manifesting anything and so I think some of that gospel about <clears throat> that there's a separate baptism of the Holy Spirit because of this evidence of laying on of hands by Philip is just a confusion about that there wasn't power given, wasn't Holy Spirit power given with the gospel of the kingdom. It was only promised to the church age that they'd receive the Holy Spirit and that comes with the, Holy, the, with the church age gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. And even when it's received, because the Spirit caught up Philip and took him away, but there's no mention that the Ethiopian eunuch spoke in tongues or manifested anything. He was just rejoiced and went on to Ethiopia. Now this is what I was reading this morning that prompted the video. Um, <clears throat> lots of people that make this point about a separate baptism of the Spirit Go right to Acts 19 as one of the proof texts. But if you back up actually to Acts 18, you see something really interesting. <clears throat> this is Apollos uh, mentioned right before the Acts 19 verses. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and began fervent in the spirit, small s. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. <clears throat> See the distinction here? And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Same mistake. He was just continuing the message that Jesus was the coming Messiah. Repent because the kingdom's at hand, right? And when he, he was disposed to pass in Archaea, and the brethren were, wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, <clears throat> when he had come, helped much with which believed through grace. 
And so um, he Apollos <clears throat> changes his message, and then you see in Acts 19 the famous scriptures that people like to glom onto that came to pass while Apollos was in Corinth. Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. Finding a certain disciple, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard of whether there be a Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Under what were you baptized? And they said, Under John's baptism. Then Paul said, Verily John baptized with baptism of repentance, saying unto the people they should believe on him which should come after him, that is Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Paul then laid hands on them and the Holy Ghost. And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And the men were about twelve. And <clears throat> I was just going to make the point here that so you have the one example of Peter coming in to correct and extend the gospel post Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Laying out of hands for the receiving of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> happened because they received Christ as the coming King, the Messiah, but they didn't receive the repentance that Jesus provided by his death, burial, and resurrection. But you saw it down when Philip went to the Ethiopian eunuch. He was reading about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ from Isaiah 53. And then the Spirit caught Philip away after the eunuch was baptized. He wasn't corrected. Now you have the situation where in Acts 18, <clears throat> Apollo, Apollos was <clears throat> preaching that kingdom of God message, but it wasn't the complete message, right? Uh, um, he was he was corrected then. I'm down here. Sorry about that. He was corrected then by um, Aquila and Priscilla, and so that he was showing that you know Jesus needed to die and to be resurrected. So the the gospel church age message needed to be corrected in what Apollos had been teaching. And so there's the distinction between the kingdom message, the coming kingdom, Jesus is the Messiah, who is going to sit on the throne, the descendant of David, the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, as a separate gospel message than what Paul was given. Let's go see that in 1 Corinthians 15 for a better context. So this is now Paul, Apostle Paul's message. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I had preached unto you, which also you had received wherein you stand, but which you are also saved, if you keep in memory that I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I deliver unto you first of all which I also received, how Christ had died for our sins according to Scripture. Bam. Isaiah 53, and that he was to be buried and rose again the third day according to scripture, and that he was seen by Peter, then of the twelve, and then he was seen by five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained at present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen by me also, as one born out of time, for I am the least of the apostles, that I am not to meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And the grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but for the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believed. And so there, the death, burial, and resurrection, the new gospel, which was given to Paul, to present was the one that comes with the power, right? That's the promise that Jesus told the disciples that they would receive the Spirit, and the Spirit only comes with the recognition of Jesus being his death, burial, and resurrection, right? Being part of the new gospel. So I think that's cool now. It's going to happen again. The church gets raptured, and I'm not going to get into why it's a pre-tribulation rapture. But I want to go to Matthew 24 and teach that this gospel message happens again. 
And so, you know, in starting in verse 8 down here, <clears throat> we've got the reference to all these things are the beginning of sorrows. And we know the timing of the sorrows by looking at 1 Thessalonians 5, right after the description of the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians 4, you have the description of the birth pangs in 1 Thessalonians 5. So the church is gone, the sorrows begin. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted. They shall kill you. You should be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Can you say the fifth seal in Revelation 6? And then many shall be offended, and they shall betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that should endure to the end... What's the end? It's actually the end of the dispensation of law, Daniel's 70th week. The same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then should come the end. So what do you see? The Jews again are being set apart. In this case, <clears throat> the persecution and the tribulation period is going to be brutal toward them. But they're once again going to receive the gospel of the kingdom. That's the role of the 144,000. Because what happens at the end of the tribulation? Jesus comes. Judgment occurs, both Gentile and Jew. And then he sets up the kingdom, the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. He sits on the throne. So once again, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. But that is not the gospel for the church age. Now it becomes the gospel for the millennial reign, which was the original attempt of Jesus to have the Jews accept him as their Messiah. But when he was rejected, the church was then born, right? So I hope that distinction is good for everybody. I hope that clears up what the kingdom gospel is different than Paul's gospel and why there was a separate laying on of hands to the people that had received the kingdom gospel, but not had received yet the death, burial, and resurrection gospel message that came with the church age. God bless everybody.